I'm Andrew Graham Dixon, and I'm an art historian. Is it a town or is it a piece of theatre? I'm Giorgio Lucatelli, and I'm a cook. So the Sultana is really tiny, little, aggressive little one, like a little Sicilian, huh? We both share a passion. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is real Baroque, Baroque yeah. yeah. This is decadent. Mm. <laughs> a love. Whoa! An obsession. I've never seen anything like that. Her name? Sicilia, the Mediterranean island of Sicily. We've both been her ardent suitors for years. I love how layers of history have created a unique blend of art and architecture here. It's like winning the World Cup in archaeological That's science. a guy. <laughs> <laughs> and I adore her incredible flavour and no-nonsense approach to food. Here you are, 10 square metre, you could find all these ingredients. Here they are in front of you. But it's only recently we discovered that we share the same intense passion for the island. So we decide to team up and travel here together. This really is the naked chef. <laughs> he is the, naked, the real one. He is the real naked chef. In sharing our knowledge and our love for the island with each other, we hope to uncover even more of the secrets and treasures. The sadness. This was a hole in a nation. This was a hole in the heart of a nation. And the pleasures of our beloved Sicily. As a piece of sincere painting, it's fantastic. From simple, delicious food packed with incredible flavour. There you are. Perfection. To the truly jaw-dropping art and culture, a mirror to the exuberance and extraordinary history of its people. Our very first stop, a place called Porto Palo, on the southern coast of the island. For me to come here, I have the same feeling that I'm going home to my village in northern Italy. I, at the moment, I feel like my heart is beating and you know, that, do you know what I mean? It's a restaurant on the beach owned by my good friend Vittorio. It may not look like much, but it's my favorite spot in all of Sicily. And the place I head first every time I come here. It's an annual pilgrimage to remind me what real, honest food is all about, Sicilian style. I hope Andrew likes it. A beautiful place. Yeah. A shack by the seaside, it looks like. I mean, that's what it was when it started. Vittorio! Where's the cinghiale, oh? Vittorio! Where's the wild boar? Where is it? Where is it? Where is the cinghiale, oh? Vittorio, come here to salute you. How are you? How are you? How are you? This is Andrew. Andrew. My friend Andrew. Today we're going to drink, he says. He's preparing for you, he's been preparing for you. We're going to go and get some fish to have dinner tonight. We're going to go and get some fish to have dinner tonight. We're going to go and get some fish to have dinner tonight. Yes, there are two bars. And at what time? We're going to give him a call. We're going to give him a call. Okay, we're going to give him a call. And we're just going to sort out, we're going to go and buy some fish to cook dinner tonight. We're going to get it from the boat directly. That's the way he cooks. Look, that's it. See, like that? And then he puts his, his... And that's, he cooks like that. That's the way I want to cook in my life. Not in London with the jacket, your name, no, and the no, deed, no, no, and like that. No. This is the way you want to cook. See, see. This really is the naked chef. This is the naked chef. The real one. is the real naked chef. The seas around Sicily have long been the richest one in the Mediterranean. And today, the Porto Sciacca boasts one of the largest fleet in all of Italy. It was founded by the Greek colonizers in ancient times. But during the Arab occupation of the 9th century, it became an important stop on the trade routes to North Africa. Trade brought hundreds of years of foreign influence and fish 
Lots of fish. Tons of the stuff still come through the port every day. So this was two days fishing. These guys is going to go to Milan with this. So this is going to be in the market tomorrow morning in Milan. So the whole boat? The whole boat, whatever it catches today, it goes on this van and goes straight to Milan. Oh, oh look at that. Turbo. Skate, 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 skate. Look at that. Beautiful. It just keeps coming. It just keeps coming. Oh, look. look at that. Yeah. Well, that little shark. It's very good to do the soup. Yeah. What I love best about Shaka are the lively dockside auction where the local argue for fish. Rough, raw, and even a little anarchy. For me, it's pure sissy. So, what happened is this. The two boats have come in, they got all the fish on top. So, that guy is telling the price of the boxes coming out. Everybody looks at the box, you buy by box. What is important to all the price up as much as they can. So they take out fish, then they stop a little bit, so that everybody panics. No more, no more, no more, no more. So it goes up at five. So 40, 45, 50. So you say it's 50 euros? 50 euros for that box. So for a price of scampers. Oh, yeah. How beautiful now. But what I don't understand is, could I come here yeah, with yeah. 50 euros? Well, if he doesn't know, maybe he won't take your bid. But no, if you're there with the money in your hands, you'll take it. If you've got your money in your hands, you'll take it. What I love about this typically Sicilian market is that although it's doing big business, a supplier to top restaurants all over the country, it's nothing fancy. It's salty, genuine, unpretentious. The fish is what's important here, not the window dressing. That's what we're going to eat tonight. What? Can I just say, what is that? Eh? Ah. Tromba. Tromba. Uh, <laughs> we're going to eat this okay. tonight. I'm not sure if I should be celebrating. Or, or I'm kind of worried about eating that. What the hell is that, Georgia? I've never seen it. I've never seen it as well. <laughs> Back at the restaurant, the kitchen is in full swing for the evening service. Like Giorgio and I, Vittorio isn't from Sicily. But when he arrived over 40 years ago, he fell in love with it and stayed. And in embracing the native approach to food, Vittorio has made Sicilian culture his own. Take the best ingredients, allow their quality to shine through, and present them with as little fuss as possible. Pasta fritta. The most important thing in Vittorio's is not to ask for the menu. They don't like the menu. They don't like the idea that they tied it into a piece of paper. It's free. It's not about writing about it. It's about getting it, cooking it, and eating it. It's the most amazing thing. You know, this is like raw sword fish, a little slice of orange has been cut underneath. So that's raw marinated raw, raw marinated fish with fish. blood orange. I'm going to and give like, you some of these. These are little tiny baby squid. Yeah. Fried. Again, this is what we saw today in the market. I mean, all the stuff that we have here now has been fished today. Sitting here in front of all this amazing riches from the sea, it strikes me that the Sicilians have always had a bit of a a dual relationship to the sea. On the one hand, it's where the enemy comes from. Right. It's where the invaders come from, the Spanish, the Arabs, all these people who dominated and controlled them. And yet, on the other hand, it's the source of so much life, such it's bounty. It, it, the bounty is so often in Sicily that there's this double aspect to something. It's funny you say that because, like, especially like in a place like Shaka, you have a division between the town. All the houses that you could see from the port, those one is where the fisherman lives, facing the sea. And they speak one dialect. The people, the other side of the Corso, you know, they are the people who works the land. The people who works the land says that the people of the sea are stupid. Because you just go out, you put down the net, or whatever comes up, you take back. Us, we are clever. We have irrigation, we grow things, we tame nature. So they see themselves as belonging to a later stage. The hunter-gatherers of the sea guys, right. and we're the agriculture. Yeah, we're the agriculture. We are Ooh. more, like, kind of civilised. We, we get water to run to where we want. So do they ever marry each other, the people from the, the land and the people from the sea? No. So real-life Romeo and Juliet? Real-life Romeo and Juliet. Amazing. It's like opera. 
It's like a, a drama. Yeah. Everything is in there. The old elements of Italian, of, of, of Sicilian culture are in it. At last, the main course arrived. Voila! Bravo! Madonna! Che bello! There's no old boy. Simple boiled lobster. Lots of vegetable, herbs, and a dressing of oil or lemon. My kind of cooking. Simple stuff, but one of the most delicious meals I've ever eaten. Mm. Oh, che bello, eh? <laughs> Cheese. Cheers. 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 Chin chin. Dai. What I love most about Sicily is how diverse and rich in culture it is. Every old town is like a three-course meal of history, beauty and atmosphere. Just as delicious as the food, just as heady as the local wines. And the best place of all to begin the feast the capital, Palermo. Colourful, theatrical. It's my favourite city anywhere in the world. A cultural layer cake baked over more than a thousand years by Sicily's diverse colonisers. Every time I come here, I discover something new to marvel at. And this is perhaps my favourite slice of that historical cake. Tucked away on a back street is this unassuming chapel, the Oratory of Santa Citta. It's the unlikely home of a magnificent artwork, and I hope Giorgio will find it every bit as tasty as I do. For me, this is the art equivalent of going and having a, an ice cream, <laughs> or perhaps a glass of bubbly. It's very light, very beautiful, very fun. Actually, I tell you what, I want you to close your eyes. <laughs> Come on, close your eyes. This is meant just to be a treat. I'm going to lead you this way. <laughs> I just want you to get the full blast. I'm going to take you here. <laughs> now, OK. Whoa! <laughs> what do you think? That is incredible. Can you believe that we just walk off that street and here we are? Yeah, you wouldn't expect something like this. So great and beautiful. This exuberant masterpiece of Baroque sculpture was created by a local artist in the second half of the 17th century. But in true Sicilian style, the origins of the work and the artist are simple. It's by this guy called Giacomo Serpotta, who was a poor artisan who lived in the area of the city yeah. where they traditionally made the statues for religious processions and ceremonies, but they also did all the theatrical scenery and props. And what is he made of? It's made of stucco. Stucco. It looks like marble, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, you see, now that's, that's interesting, because his secret was that he added a bit of marble dust. Right. You, you, you create an armature of wooden wire, and then you make a paste. And to this paste, he added marble dust, and that meant that he could get a kind of fineness of texture. So whereas all the other stucco artists were forced to paint their figures to make them lifelike, he actually created it in the form itself. So it's not cast. Everything is made one by one. Yeah. He had a workshop. I love it. But he finished every single figure himself. The other reason I thought you'd like it is that it seems to me that it's also... It's almost like a culinary art, the creation of stucco. It is like a massive cake from the inside. <laughs> the thing that he was really famous for, and I think it's where you get the full theatricality, is these putti, you know, the little babies, yeah, which they are, are everywhere. Yeah, yeah they, and, and they get smaller as they go up, which is, gives you this almost more in, the impression that it's really tall. So well, it's basically a theatrical curtain. And into that theatrical curtain, he's carved a series of little, almost like little theatre boxes. Oh, and yeah. each one tells a story. But see, on the side walls, we have the stories of the life of Christ. Ah, yes, the and Via Crucis. Exactly. Yeah. But if you look at each one, 
You look at the scene, for example, you've got baby Jesus asleep in the manger, and above, look, the putto, he's sleeping. Look at that. Sir Potter is a guy from the streets. We know his dad died in prison, mm. left the family with no money. And this was Sir Potter's first commission on a grand scale. It was the first time he was given a chance to do something like this with his, if you like, street artist know-how. And did he pull it off or what? <laughs> he did, definitely. He really did. So you like it? I love it. <laughs> The scene in Sir Potter's Stucco Boxes reminds me how theatrical Sicilian culture could be. There is one kind of theatre that epitomizes Sicily more than anything else that I can think of, the art of puppetry. I remember taking my daughter, Margarita, to see a show when she was a child, and I loved it. I thought Andrew would too. UNESCO protector, the Cuticchio Theatre is recognized as the best on the island. Many of the ancient stories are the same one that inspired the Crusaders, but they've been Sicilianized. The characters include knights in Spanish armor, Arab Saracen, and Norman noblemen, all of whom invaded the island. They are tales of vendetta, passion, and brutal conflict. A reminder that this island was born as much out of blood as sunshine. Before leaving, I want to catch a quick word with the puppet master, Mimo Cuticchio. His family have been puppeteers for over three generations. Lo sta tenendo in braccio come se fosse un bambino. Ma loro sono i miei figli perché io li ho costruiti. They are my children. I build them. Tutti i bambini pensano, o anche grandi, come fa a prendere la spada? Abbassa la mano, impugna la spada ed è pronto per combattere. Paladini, andiamo tutti alla battaglia. Andiamo a combattere. E lui, diciamo, guardando dall'alto, rimette a posto la spada. Bravissimo. <laughs> Voglio cominciare per dire grazie. Per me è la prima volta, it's my first time. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. One of the best things I've ever seen. It's a combination of visual art, sculpture, theater, arte literature, sculture. Sì, sì, è molto visivo e anche tutto solo, in stesso tempo. Solo. Also your acting. È, è come un film muto. It's, yes, it is like a silent film and they've got these strong da qui faces. Le immagini e da dietro. Arrosomonta, venite maledetti, vi ucciderò tutti come cani rognosi. I have to say that he scares me a little bit. It reminds me of Mangiafuoco, which was the guy in Pinocchio who used to... Ha paura un po' di lei. Noi abbiamo... Meglio, meglio avere paura. Oggi non ha paura più nessuno. We certainly been scared tonight. Siamo stati... Grazie. Tornate al teatro dei pupi. We will. Grazie. Grazie, un piacere, un piacere, un piacere, grazie. Buon viaggio. Grazie. Arrivederci. Andiamolo a fare. Palermo became the capital of Sicily in the year 902, when Muslim Arab colonizers first consolidated their grip on the island. They say it was one of the most beautiful cities in Europe. I think they said the three great cities of the time were Cordoba, yeah. Damascus, and, and, Palermo. and Palermo. And they said that in Palermo they had a thousand mosques. So to see what's left of that, we're off to the Calsa, now the ancient Arab quarter of Palermo, but once the very city itself. 
To get there, we've got to brave the very modern traffic. The so little left of the Arab city, I mean, you really have to scratch quite deep to get any traces of them. But if you look hard enough, they are there. They love their horses, don't they? <laughs> and that's an Arab influence. They're that's obsessed with horses in yeah. Sicily. Uh, really expressing your uh, Palermitano <laughs> in uh, driving. Uh... I'm trying to blend in. Yeah. I'm introducing Andrew to the flavor of Arab Sicily with a dish called pasta con le sarde, sardine pasta, a Sicilian classic with a pinch of North Africa. Buongiorno, signor Franco. Buongiorno. Come va? Bene, piacere. Signor Franco Trattoria is shut during the day. So we arranged to borrow his kitchen to prepare the dish for lunch. The most important ingredient of pasta de sarde is the finocchietto selvatico di montagna, so it's the wild mountain fennel. It's only used in Sicily, nowhere else. So this is that stuff that we see everywhere, by the yes. roadside, yeah, it seems to grow in profusion. Right, okay. So the idea is then we're going to put some of that in the boiling water, which we seasoned, OK? Mm -hmm. We put a little bit of the finocchietto, so then when we cook the pasta, it'll take up all the flavour. Okay? As that one is infusing, you're going to start to cook that sauce. Okay. You're going to put a little bit of the anchovies in it. Okay? It's nice to use anchovies instead than salt, you know? I love anchovies. Can I eat some of your ingredients? Just... No, don't eat anything. Don't spoil your appetite, and then you're going to say you're not one, hungry. One little bit of anchovies. Drink. That's okay. Okay, the next thing that I'm going to put in, sultanas. You saw the sultana is really tiny little bit, an aggressive little one, like a little Sicilian, huh? As this is cooking gently, I'm going to add a little bit more of oil. So in order to keep the temperature low, so I let it cook. I want the onions and the sultanas and everything else to take, you know, in the flavor of the anchovies. This is strato, which is like, you know, it's like a, it's like a tomato paste. Also, you can taste it. But instead of being cooked down, this is sun-dried. So they made this paste, lay down on the big, it's, like a, it's almost like a, a sweet. Yeah. It's delicious. Yeah. I'm going to put like a spoonful of that. And then... So these are the, the sardine. The pearl. sardine. They go in. And whose idea was it to put these ingredients together? OK, there is a story that says that when the Arabs arrived in, in Mazzara del Vallo, they found themselves with something like 1,000 men, the army, and so the guys who was in command asked them to do some food for these people that they, they, they arrive in the land. And so these were all the, the actually ingredients that they found. This, the smell is incredible, isn't it? OK? And I'm going to put my pasta in now. Bang! Now, there is one more thing. Some people does it, some people don't. But, you know, I like to put it in. It's a little bit of saffron. Well, this is also Arabic, no? That's, that's why, sort of, you know. And I don't know, you're not going to kind of like... You'll give him a, a, a base on the flavour. What's the characteristic that makes it particularly expressive of, of Arabic Sicilian cuisine? Uh, is it the combination of things? I think it's the combination of the flavour, the ingredients and the culture that they have. There's no other pasta that is made with sultanas in it. So that sweetness and that edge of the sweet and sour that they use, that's very Arabic. That's something that is like... And you, you, that sweet, sweet-sour combination, so you don't Sweet. really find that in Northern Italian pasta recipes, you really... That's all in Sicily, then this is fun. OK, I'll get in the pasta. Really nice. OK, we have to wait. There's one more very important thing to do now, which is... La mollica. Breadcrumbs and olive oil give you that little extra flavour coming. OK, we should go. You haven't even opened the wine. What is the matter with you? By the time you've served the pasta, the wine will be open. I always find when I'm serving pasta at home, like, all the best bit stuff gets left at the bottom and I have to go around everyone's plates again. Just get stuck in. Just do it. Mmm. It's a great smell. This is going to be ugly. It's not very easy to eat elegantly, Jordan. 
No, this is not meant to, not elegant people eat this. This is meant to be by the workers, the people in the port, mm. the people, you know, people who can only afford sardines, sardines, mm. yeah? Almost my favourite plate of pasta that I ever ate. Do you? Really? I oh. love it. I just, it's, it's so unusual. The, Thank you, the sweet and sour and everything. No, very good. Mm. Well, after a lunch like that, it only seems right to take Giorgio to see one of the few remaining Arabic buildings in Palermo, a palace called the Ziza. Built in the 12th century, it comes from the Arabic word El Aziz, magnificent. Although it was commissioned by a Norman king, William I, it's in the Arabic tradition. The architects who designed it were instructed to create a pleasure palace which indulged the king's passion for hunting, and women. This, this honeycomb vaulting, that's very... It really is impressive, isn't it's it? It's very Arabic. You see it in the, in the Alhambra, and also these tiles are like Islamic tiles. That's right. right. This is actually a palace built for a Norman king, but they say that he, he was actually a Christian. He lived here like a sultan. He had five wives. That's good. You know. <laughs> but I love this. Right. Oh, that's a little fountain coming down. I can imagine the little noise that it would make, like... To really kind of... Riff jump like if it was in a little torrent and, and they'll carry on until it goes out there and they'll have a gazebo built in the middle and then all the water will be around it like a swimming pool sort of style and then the fish would be kept in there so it was called a peschiera so when they want to fish for lunch out the fish comes and off it goes on the table so this decoration keeps yeah. the palace cool creates this sort of sense almost of living in an indoor yeah. garden. But you've also got the added benefit of fresh of fish. Of fresh fish. I mean, you had to think about the Arabs and they introduced the irrigation. So the use of water, the, they were masterful on getting the water where they wanted. And, you know, water inside the building, that's a typical thing of the Arabs. The Arabs always have fun to inside. I sort of think of this space as a kind of microcosm of what happens to Arab culture after the Arabs have gone. Yes. It still stays embedded in the system. Nowhere is the Arab legacy more keenly felt than in the great food market. Palermo has four of them. Established by the Arabs over 1,000 years ago, they still feel like a Casbah. But as well as being great traders, the Arabs were brilliant agriculturalists, which enabled new fruits and vegetables to flourish on the island. This is the most famous of Palermo's markets, the Vuciria. The name literally means habab, in reference to all the shouting that goes on in here. I want to buy ingredients for dinner tonight, but I haven't decided what to cook. So, like any Sicilian, we go for the freshest, the tastiest option. Buongiorno. The fish seller insists that the sardines are the best. So, even though we had them yesterday, they're back on the menu tonight. Anche se un po' più di mezzo chilo va bene, eh? Va bene mezzo chilo. Sì, anche un po' di più magari. And Andrew loves them, so we'll be happy. Look at the beautiful color. They're like silver, aren't they? Yes, he's going to clean them for us. Okay, so that's what he does. He takes the heads off. It's seven steps. Okay, he picks the sardine up. Look, a one, heads off, down. It's just a hand. He's not even looking what he's doing. He just fills it with his fingers, you see? He fills the bone, and <laughs> bone, the bones comes off. See, here you go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Done. I'll tell you the tragedy, one. George. Is when I do this at home, quando io faccio a casa, it takes me two, two minutes, doing minuti per un pesce. Per una sardina. <laughs> What's really new? about tonight's menu is caponata, a delicious vegetable relish you'll find in every house across Sicily. All I need is a few simple ingredients. Poi una testa di sedano, e poi magari due peperoni gialli e due rossi, due cipolle, magari quelle là bianche, quelle là bianche che sono bellissime. E poi abbiamo tutto, siamo a posto. All the ingredients are here. Look, it already looks like the recipe is done. Perfetto. We don't need the recipe, isn't it? All this food has given us an appetite for art. 
The Vucheria market was immortalized in a painting by Sicily's most celebrated modern artist, Renato Guttuso. Painted from memory in 1974, when Guttuso was living in Rome, it captures all the color and the detail of the real market. I think it's a picture that appeals to all the senses, isn't it? It does. The style is sort of, as it were, a piece of the past that's frozen. It's like a time machine. Here he is, painting in a kind of ancient folkloric style in the 1970s, 10 years before his death. And there's that market that we saw this morning. And how much has changed in that market? And nothing. I mean, nothing. They've still got those light bulbs, that profusion of fruit and vegetables. I mean, even the clothes seem the same. And the, the packaging, also what the, they're using. We saw. Do you remember we saw the guy doing yes, the twist of paper? Exactly. This twist of paper, the same. It's down. Every last detail. Nothing has changed. The details are incredible as well. Like the fish, and they are completely in rigoris mortis. Like you know, they're just yes, really standing up with yes. the. I had never seen that before, and you explained to me that it's because the fish are so fresh. So they're fresh. still in rigor mortis. <laughs> a lot of art critics and art historians turn their nose up a bit at his late work, right? Because they say, they say, how can this painter who knew Picasso, how can he continue to paint in this old-fashioned, folkloric, anecdotal way? You know, this isn't serious art. But if you take that away and you just look at it as a piece of sincere painting, it's fantastic. And what is amazing is this verticality that he has, no? It goes on and on and on and on. It's like, you know, there is no end, you know, it just goes on. Like, it really gives you the impression that the road is going up. He's fish-eyed it, isn't he? Uh, but the painting also hints at the darker side of Sicilian history, a Sicily of ancient feuds and modern violence. The more you look at it, the more you see. There seems to be a kind of vendetta brewing between the fishmonger who's holding the swordfish, almost like a blade, the blade of the swordfish, and the cheese seller. And I notice that there's a little pentimento in the cheese cellar's near his hand. A pentimento is where you've painted something out. And if you look closely, he may, I think he originally had a knife. Mm. So I wonder if they're looking at each other. I mean, that's and the it's only like, is, Do you think it's the origin of a vendetta or something? Could the woman in the middle be, you know, is it maybe... Maybe there was a love story between some of them or something, because it's really crossing. Everything else seems to be vertical. Okay? Yeah. Well, this is the only moment that you have something going horizontal that, you know, that, that look between themselves and the two. Because you don't know what the woman is doing, always looking at, obviously she's walking out with this big bag in her hand. I think Gattuso actually said that the, 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 the line that connects those guys' eyes, he called it the line of death. Ah. And the line that goes up through the centre of the picture is the line of life. And between them they make a cross. It's so sort of visceral, isn't it? It's so yeah. Sicily. And there's a secret story going on as well. Mm. I cannot think about any other picture than just fulfill me more than this one. Obviously, it's about food, and, 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 and you know, my it's life almost is... almost edible. <laughs> my life is all about food. And so this is like, this something is jumping at you. It's just the richness of that, and the vibrancy of the color, and the, you know, the vegetable, you almost smell it. I think this is a picture you'd like for your personal collection, isn't it? I would love to have this in my collection. As Giorgio prepares dinner, I leaf through an old cookbook my mother gave me, Italian Food by Elizabeth David. I've always loved the book for its graphic, vivid illustrations, sketched, in fact, by the painter of the Vucheria. Renato Gattuso. But David's beautiful capturing of the strong, earthy flavors of Mediterranean cooking in words is just as vivid as the pictures. David was the first writer to introduce a war-weary British public to the gutsy flavors of Italian cooking back in the 1950s. And she even includes a recipe for caponata, the Sicilian dish Giorgio's preparing. The first time that I ate caponata, I was in the army, and there was these Sicilian guys. And he went home to Sicily, and he come back, and he come back with this jar of caponata that his mum made. And he brought them in, got this bread, and we just put this caponata on top of the bread, and we ate it like that. And I thought, wow, this was like, blow me completely away. 
little restaurants by the sea, they always have the caponata. Yeah. But each one is different. So, so basically, everybody makes their own caponata. Oh, they find and, their own balance. And you will find, if you talk to them, they, they think that there is the best. And this is so beautiful. Sometimes. So whose are we making now? Are we making yours? We're, we're making, making your caponata. OK? Oh, I see. Right. So here is the base. You got the aubergine and the onions. So we're going to mix them together. You want a bit of courgette? In Definitely it? courgette. Yeah, and we could put them all in there. Would you like the peppers in it? Definitely the peppers. We want all the colours of the market. That's I, want, I want all the colours of the painting. Your olives? Yeah. We shall put them all in this one. Yeah, we didn't do too many. I like it when you sort of discover the olives, so yeah. you have a few mouthfuls maybe where you yeah. don't even get one. You want to every now and again, ta! You yeah, find exactly. them all. You're cooking with all your senses with your nose, with your hands, with your eyes. You know, the whole thing is coming together. Absolutely beautiful, doesn't it? It's some tomato salsa. I want the tomato, but I don't know how much. Mm. It needs a bit of sugar. What does it do to you? It looks good. OK. But what about those sardines? Let's okay. see what else you can do with these everyday fish. OK, look, I do one, you have to do the other one. So we're going to put a little bit of breadcrumbs, a little bit of olive oil, and we'll put them in the oven, and that is it. We want the tail to stay up and, and to be really tight, otherwise they're going to oh, explode up. Okay. Oh, I see, you don't want any of the stuffing to come That's outside. That's right. Perfect. Look, what we're going to do, we take one of the right. toothpick, and we go like two at a time. What's the essence of the stuffing again? It's breadcrumbs. Breadcrumbs. A little bit of orange juice, a little bit of lemon juice, some pine kernel. What I like about that market is the immediacy of it. And I was talking to the fish guy and saying, oh, you don't seem to have much fish today. And he said, oh, well, it, no, there was a storm yesterday, so it wasn't very good fishing. Yeah. But the sardines were good. Yeah. They were so beautiful, the sardine there. <laughs> yeah, they were. I thought, you know, I, I, this is very Sicilian. They don't go out the house with the idea of, of the recipe in their pocket. Yeah, they yeah. They buy yeah. with their eyes. They buy what sort of, like, really turns them on at that moment. Right. It's really, really important. OK. Can't wait. Maybe we'll have to have a glass of wine. <laughs> OK, here we go. Absolutely, absolutely cooked. Oh, See, they like little birds, isn't it? That's why they like becafico. That smells good. Can I give you some caponata? That would be great. Don't forget that you got the... I won't forget. I'm not going to eat the toothpick. Mm. They're nice. Oh my gosh, what with the caponata? Mmm. Mm. That's nice. What I like about that is that for me is the whole market in a plate. And here we just chosen the nicest fish that they had that day. But coming back to Elizabeth David, I sort of think, okay, an English woman when when was she doing this? The 1950s. Mm. When Mediterranean cuisine was really not known in England. I think of England in the 1950s, I think of every, I think of the landscape as grey, the city is grey, and the food is brown. And you can't, if someone in that generation comes to Italy. She fell in love with it. And you can see that in the book. Mm. It was not a matter of technicality. That's why the book stands out after 50 years. That's why it's difficult to write a, a book for English people, then it's better than that. It's like a love letter to Italy. This... And, I, and I love the fact that she got our man Gattuso, you know, the painter of the market who captured all the colours and all the flavours in a painting, she got him to do the illustrations. Cheers. Salute. Us. Sicily's had many rulers over the years, and in 1072, after two centuries, the Arabs surrendered control of Palermo to a new colonial power. The Normans were already ruling much of Europe, and soon the whole island was under their control. In 1130, the son of the first Norman ruler of Sicily, 
Roger II crowned himself king. And I want to show Giorgio his personal place of worship, the Palatine Chapel. So what's your saying? This is incredible. Built in 1132, it's the work of Byzantine Greek and Arab craftsmen. What is the function of this room? There's a chapel. Yeah. Built for a Norman king. Right. King Roger. Arguably, it's the most fine surviving medieval ensemble of art and architecture anywhere in the world. I mean, the other thing that's amazing about this chapel is that it's been in continuous use as a chapel since the 12th century. It's incredible, isn't it? Look at that. It's like an Arab ceiling, isn't it? But it's an incredible sort of piece of work, all made out of cedar wood. It's called a stalactite technique. Right. And it had only been invented in the Arab world 100 years before. Here you've got Byzantine mosaics. Incredible Italian. Look at this floor, the right. stonework. And these walls, right. wonderful decoration. The Normans were very conscious that they it didn't have much visual culture of their own. Okay. So their tendency was to be magpies right. and to take the absolute best that they could find in right. each place that they conquered. And of course, Sicily had such a rich variety of different heritages that they could create something like this. So if you would have been made somewhere else in northern Italy, you wouldn't have all the Arab influence in it. The Normans ruled England. <laughs> in fact, they, take, they were taking over England just about the same time as they were taking over Sicily. They didn't create anything like this there no. because they didn't have the materials to draw on. In a way, what you get here is you get both aspects of what I think of as the Byzantine mosaic tradition. Mm. On the one hand, you get the vault of heaven, Christ looking down on you. With the angels yeah. surrounding him. Yeah. But then the other side of it is this storytelling tradition right. that has a huge influence on Italian fresco tradition. Yeah. The nativity, the baptize of Christ. Isn't it beautiful, the baptism? It's I so love fun. the way they do the water. Yeah, just on top of it, you can see the rippling of the water, the two images coming out, and then the angel with the towel is fantastic. The angel with the towel. Well, I think this bit is truly stunning, isn't it? I think when you're here, you can feel very much how this church, if you like, or this chapel pulls in two different directions. Mm. At the far end, you've, you feel under the eye of God. But at this end, where Roger would have sat enthroned with Christ's power, as it were, sort of being beamed down directly onto his head, you feel that this space is very much an assertion of kingship. Divine right to rule. Yeah. But what I love, I mean, just look at this. The quality of Isn't that fantastic? Because in the Islamic world, they weren't allowed to express God through the figure. Right. So they had to express the idea of God, the power of God, the perfection of God through this wonderful geometry, through this color, through this patterning. Mm. So that also is a way of Roger expressing his power. It's almost like he's taking power from different cultures. But he doesn't forget to put himself in the middle of that. That is court of arms. Yeah. It's going out like that. So the power from above, from God, but the political power, the ruler, I th from this I side. think that's what this space is about. And I also think that, that that ambiguity is partly what makes it so compelling. But this intoxicating building isn't just a museum. As a working church, it's the most popular place to get married in Palermo today. One of the things I love most about Sicily is the fact that the people really inhabit their own rich history, and the Palatine Chapel's no exception. History isn't merely heritage here, something to be preserved behind glass. It's alive, present, highly visible in the fabric of everyday life. Perché benedica questi suoi figli che stanno per celebrare il loro matrimonio. But the greatest threat to this sense of living history in recent times is also quintessentially Sicilian, the Mafia. In the early 60s, the Mafia infiltrated the city council and managed to have many of Palermo's great historic buildings demolished. Why? 
to replace them with shoddy concrete tower blocks as way of laundering the drug money in a catastrophe that some call the sack of Palermo. But the mafia organization would eventually be challenged. In the 1980s, a Palermitan judge called Giovanni Falcone began investigating the Sicilian crime network. He wasn't prepared to be bored, so the mafia had him murder on the motorway that runs into Palermo. The date of the murder was the 23rd of May 1992. It is imprinted in the memory of every Italian. The spot where Falcone, his wife and the bodyguards were killed near the suburb of Capaci is marked with the memorial. For us Italian, it's almost a sacred place. You can see the place. There you are. So clear in the front of you. Can you see that? Yeah. See, they have a little space to stop because people want to stop here. I want to show Andrew the place, high above the motorway, from where the Mafia assassin, Giovanni Brusca, committed the murders. Falcone had been working in Rome and flew in to spend the weekend in Palermo. He was driving from the airport when the murders happened. You can see, that's Punta Raisi, the airport. Giovanni Falcone fly in, he's having a day off. So there's two teams. One team that has been up here, the day before they lay down the explosive down there, and they have a remote. The other team is at the airport and is coming behind Judge Falcone. They're traveling in this convoy of three cars, and the Falcone is on the second car. He travels next to them and it gives them a signal to tell them what was the speed that they're having. It tells them they're going 120 kilometers an hour. Why they're is that important? In order to get it right, to blow it at the moment that it's going over where they place the explosive. So they disappear for a second and they come around the bend. Giovanni Brusca is holding the remote and the other guy loses it completely and start to shout, press the button, press the button now, press it now. And Giovanni holds it, holds it, holds it, holds it. He knows that there is a little relay because he's tried his system before. So he waits until the car are coming to the second bend there, and then he presses it. First car is gone, and the car of Giovanni Falcone is right in the middle. Hell, practically hell happened there. The road was a hole. But not only the significance of that, it's like front of war to this day. This was not just a hole in the ground. This was a hole in the nation. This was a hole in the heart of a nation. If these guys can be killed like that, nobody who served the state is safe. This is the great message that they were trying to put on. So, I mean, is it fair to say that, that this moment marked the beginning, even here in Sicily, of, of a popular revulsion against the Mafia? Definitely. The people really understood that they could not allow something like that to happen. But Falcone's death would kickstart the popular revolt against the Mafia. The Sicily I love so much began to find a voice to fight back. In 2004, the Adial Pizza Collective was born in Palermo, an organization of business who refused to pay the pizza protection money to the Mafia. Now, over 700 business across Sicily are part of the movement. And one of the first to take a stand was the owner of the Antica Focacceria, Vincenzo Conticello. When he reported the Mafia demands for bribes to the police, 
the mafia repeatedly vandalized the restaurant and threatened to kill him. Buongiorno. It got so bad that Vincenzo had to leave Palermo and now lives under 24-hour police protection. Grazie. Valentina Lomeo, who works here, remembers the threats and intimidation very well. Vincenzo found uh, the, her, his cat and uh, then his dog died. And, uh, they he, killed his cat yes. and his dog. Yes. Just one process after another. Yes, to scare him. And then he found uh, his car broken and open. So they, they say to they say him, uh, uh, we will find you. The implication to me is if they kill your cat and they kill your dog, that's a way of saying, well, next, maybe your child, yeah. mm. maybe your wife. It, it's, uh, so he was a very, he's a very brave man. Yeah, it, it's a very, very brave man. But he, uh, he, he discovered that he, he was a brave man in that moment. This is an incredible story. It makes me want to cry, man. Where is Vincenzo now? I can't 